Blog Talk Radio. And in those days, there were giants in the land, and the sons of the angels of God looked upon the daughters of men and found them fair, and took of them wives, and their sons became of old great men of renown. So they have been mixing with us on a genetic level since the time of Enoch and Ezekiel's will. Here on earth we're intrigued by the sun, moon, and stars And imagine there's got to be planets like ours So conceive of a face on the surface of Mars So indeed of a meaning and purpose we fall That indeed they believe that these might be our gods Or that maybe with time we'll do right and evolve And eventually reach what they seek And then solve all the problems of man But they really don't know that they fall And the works of our hands are but just filthy rags So we travel the lands to dig up our past Time elapses and with it are much of the facts Some imagine that God came in alien craft They react in this way They're so desperate for meaning and purpose But satanic service They know that they have evil motives Am I making you nervous? Ha, I'm just scratching the surface The lines from Ezekiel's wheel When the skies unfold like scrolls And the breaking of seals Heed the warning The message is clear Heed the warning the time draws near, see the lines from Ezekiel's wheel When the skies unfold like scrolls and the breaking of seals He's a warning, the message is clear, he's a warning The time draws near, in the blink of an eye All believers will be raptured, anyone left receives a mark on their caption This leader will arise, claim his own riches are alien Possessed by Satan on the side of the Nephilim Possessed those who left held us back from evolving And now that they're gone, we'll solve all of our problems The worship of any one God will be halted When evolving to God, then ourselves be exalted They'll play on these lines, and in time they'll devise And arrive at a plan that will help him at times All the ones left behind, the spiritually blind He sold in their souls, now we see in their minds It's already started, we're seeing the signs Just study the word prophecies all the lines Now chop off the heads of all those who fight at one earth World. Aren't you excited? The lines from Ezekiel's wheel When the skies unfold like scrolls And the breaking of seals He's a warning The message is clear He's a warning The time draws near See the lines from Ezekiel's wheel When the skies unfold like scrolls And the breaking of seals He's a warning The message is clear He's a warning The time draws near Hello, readers, listeners, and viewers. This is Zen Garcia with FallenAngels.tv. It's Sunday, May 3rd, 2009. It's 2.30 p.m. We're streaming out of Athens, Georgia, and I have with me today as co-host Georgia Johnson from Truth Seekers of the Matrix. Georgia, do you want to say hi to the listening audience? Yes, I want to say hi to everyone out there, and today is going to be such a fantastic show. I'm glad that you're all going to be joining us, and I'm sure Zen has a lot of good information to pass to everyone, so I'm just feeling blessed to be able to, you know, come on and also speak with him on this topic. Thank you, Zen. Well, we're glad that you could uh, join us, Georgia, and it's always nice to have dialogue because I find that in sharing dialogue on these particular issues, uh, so much more comes out in, in the course of conversation. Uh, but before we go into the issue, just so you know, um, I wanted to touch upon one specific teaching from the Book of Jubilees. Um, and the reason I wanted to touch upon this is to show to everybody that, um, that Hebrew was the original language prior to the flood, and also to verify to everybody that the Sumerian teachings that came up post-flood are not older than Judeo-Christian heritage. And I'm going to prove this with um, these two particular uh, passages from the Book of Jubilees. From the Book of Jubilees, Chapter 3, uh, in a specific chapter entitled Expulsion Day Sacrifice and the Law of Covering Shame, it says... And he made for them garments of skin, and he dressed them and sent them from the Garden of Eden. On that day, the mouth of all the beasts and the cattle and birds and whatever walked or moved was stopped from speaking because all of them used to speak with one another with one speech and one language. Um, prior to the fall, all the animals in paradise, even with Adam and Eve, everybody spoke 
Hebrew. Um, another, another quote from the book of Jubilees, chapter 12, verse 25. It, it says, the revival of Hebrew. And the Lord God said to me, open his mouth and his ears so that he might hear and speak with his mouth in the language which is revealed because it ceased from the mouth of all the sons of men from the day of the fall. And I opened his mouth and his ears and his lips, and I began to speak with him in Hebrew, in the tongue of creation. And he took his father's books, and they were written in Hebrew, and he copied them, and he began studying them thereafter. And I caused him to know everything which he was unable to understand, and he studied them in the six months of rain. Uh, what this book is talking about is how the Lord restored the language of Hebrew to Abraham when he anointed him and led him out of Ur, Ur um, and led him away from the pagan religion, the Sumerian religion, and took him into the promised land and made a covenant with him and his, his descendants to give them the promised land. So that lets you know that before the flood, Hebrew also was the language of, um, of all the tribes and all the nations up until the Tower of Babel. And then once the Tower of Babel came into play, that's when the Lord came down and separated all the tongues and the tribes and the nations and put people in different regions of the land. The particular teachings I'm going to cover today, uh, excuse me while I take a sip of water. All right, sorry about that. Uh, the particular book I'm going to be talking about today is a, a book uh, called The Lost Book of Inky. And this is from Sumerian cuneiform text. And again, I don't give any credence to uh, the Sumerian teachings. They are not gospel. And they, don't, uh, they are not authentic with the word of the Lord, um, as told to us by Yahweh, and as revealed to us by his son, Yahushua, Savior, Messiah. But these particular books are interesting in that they expound upon the kind of technology that the fallen angels had prior to humanity being um, placed in, in body on the sixth day. Uh, for those of you that have not covered the three world ages, you can, I've talked about this on a number of different shows. Matter of fact, the first time we talked about this was on Georgia's show. But in that show, we spoke about how the fallen angels were banished uh, from the heavens on the second day, and that from the second to the sixth day, they had a uh, full reign of the, of, the, of the heavens as far as the, our solar system. And this particular book, The Lost Book of Inky, also talks about um, how they established way stations, as they call it, upon the planet Mars and upon the, on the moon. And so I'm just going to read uh, some of this, and, and then, Georgia, I'll get you to comment on it. And if anybody would like to... Stop me at any point to get um, clarity on this story, uh, please do so. But I'm going to go ahead and start with the introduction of this book. It says, um, and this is, the intro is by Zachariah Sitchin, as he's one of the only ones that can read the Sumerian language. But, um, you know, I don't believe that these ancient astronauts, these fallen angels, were the ones that came down here and created uh humanity. That is part of the great deception that the Vatican is going to be pulling. It's uh, part of the great fall in the way that Thessalonians talk, talked about. And the great deception will be part of this, uh, these ancient astronauts, so-called uh, aliens, whatever, coming back and being the benefactors of humanity or the so-called uh, creators of humanity. And this is the, going to be the great lie that uh, many are going to fall for. But anyways, in the introduction, it says that some 445,000 years ago, astronauts from another planet came to Earth in search of gold. 
Splashing down in one of Earth's seas, they waded ashore and established Eridu, home in the far away. In time, the initial settlement expanded to a full-fledged mission control with a mission control center, a spaceport, mining operations, and even a way station on Mars. Short of manpower, uh, the astronauts uh, employed genetic engineering to fashion primitive workers, homo sapiens, the deluge that catastrophically swept over the Earth, required a fresh start, and the astronauts became gods, granting mankind civilization, teaching it to worship. Then about 4,000 years ago, all that had been achieved unraveled in a nuclear calamity brought about by the visitors to Earth in the course of their own rivalries and wars. And just as the Bible talks about there being a war between the bloodlines, between the Sethite and the Canaanite lines, um, interestingly enough, in Sumerian uh, literature, uh, it talks about um, a, a war between the Enlilites and the Ankiites. Uh, but anyways, I'm going to go on to, because this particular book also talks about the history of Nibiru before these so-called ancient astronauts came here to the Earth and why it is that they came here to the Earth. The reason being, uh, is, if you know the work of Zachariah Sitchin, he says that upon their planet there was uh, ecological devastation and that there was a hole in the ozone much like we have here upon our planet. Uh, one of the ways that they came to to learn to heal this uh, this hole in their atmosphere, uh, which there was much havoc being wreaked by the um, the intense heat of the sun, um, was to crush up gold particles into a fine powder dust and to suspend this into the atmosphere so that it could reflect and refract the waves of the sun. Um, and so that they could establish uh, their atmosphere back on their planet. And so that was the whole reason why they had to come to these other planets was in seeking gold. But continuing on, uh, Georgia, did you want to comment before I go on with any of this? Oh, uh, we lost Georgia. Uh, call back in, Georgia, and then we'll get you to comment. All right. In the olden times, it says, the gods came to earth and created the earthlings. Now, I don't believe that. Of course, I know that Yahweh created mankind and humanity. In the prior times, none of the gods was on the earth, nor was the earthlings yet fashioned. In the prior times, the abode of the gods was on their own planet. Nibiru is its name. A great planet, reddish in radiance, around the sun an elongated circuit Nibiru makes. For a time in the cold is Nibiru engulfed. For part of its circuit by the sun strongly is it heated. A thick atmosphere Nibiru enveloped by volcanic eruptions constantly fed. All manner of life this atmosphere sustains. Without it there will be only perishing. In the cold period the inner heat of Nibiru it keeps about the planet like a warm coat that is constantly renewed. In the hot period, it shields Nibiru from the sun-scorching sun rays. In its midst, rains it holds and releases to lakes and streams giving rise. Lush vegetation our atmosphere feeds and protects. All manner of life in the waters and on the land to sprout it caused. Okay. After eons of time, our own species sprouted by our own essence, an eternal seed to procreate. As our numbers grew, to many regions of Nibiru our ancestors spread. Some tilled the land, some four-legged creatures shepherded, some lived on the mountains and some in the valleys their home made. Rivalries occurred, encroachments happened, clashes occurred, Six became weapons, clans gathered into tribes, and then two great nations each other faced. The nation of the north against the nation of the south took up arms. What was held by hand to thrusting missiles was turned. Weapons of thunder and brilliance increased the terror. 
a war long and fierce engulfed the planet, brother amassed against brother. There was death and destruction both north and south, and for many circuits desolation reigned the land. All life was diminished. Then a truce was declared. Then peacekeeping was conducted. Let the nations be united, the emissaries said to one another. Let there be one throne on Nibiru, one king to reign over all. Let a leader from the north or from south by lot be chosen, one king supreme to be. If he be from north, let south choose a female to be his spouse, as equal queen to reign alongside. If by lot a south male be chosen, let the north female be his spouse. Husband and wife let them be as one flesh to become. Let their firstborn son be the successor. Let a unified dynasty thus be formed, unity on Nibiru forever to establish. In the midst of the ruins, peace was started, north and south by marriage united. The royal throne into one flesh combined, an unbroken line of kingship established. The first king after peace was made, a warrior of the north he was, a mighty commander. By lots, true and fair was he chosen. His decrees and unity were accepted. His, for his abode he built a splendid city, a god day. Unity, meaning, was, his na was its name. And for his reign, a royal title he was granted. On it was, the celestial one was its meaning. With strong arm, order in the lands he established, laws and regulations he decreed, governors for each land he appointed, restoration and reclamation was their foremost task. Of him in the royal annals, thus it was recorded, on the land unified, peace on Nibiru he restored. And then the next part of the book goes into the different kings that came about after on. Um, George, are you on with us again? Hey, yeah, I'm sorry. I was uh, involved in the chat line and looking at some of the questions that were, uh, or statements that were referred to your show. And I just want things on it, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, basically, a lot of people call what Zen's talking about as sci-fi and really non-existent, but you know, if we even go back in the Bible, they talk about the Sumerians and so forth. But what I really want to make comment to is a lot of people don't believe in using, like, the extra biblical text. And you read out of the Book of Jubilees. Well, the Book of Jubilees, Jubilees actually gives credence to the Bible. And it says how, you know, basically that the Hebrew language, unlike what the Sumerians, uh, what they're teaching today about the Sumerian texts and tables and all this stuff, that they were the first language when it's not true. So, you know, we're trying to give credence to God's word, whereas um, uh, a lot of people in today's society believe that these fallen, well, they call them gods. And, you know, a lot of your society today, even your uh, cultures, have these false gods. And we're just trying to show you where this information is coming from. So I want to put that out there because I think a lot of people are being misled, thinking that we're talking sci-fi. And we're not talking sci-fi. We're talking actually a reality that not too many people are aware of. So that's what I want to add. <laughs> uh, just for the listeners and audience members out there, uh, just know, you know, I want you to doubt everything that I'm saying. Go out and do your own research. The, what I'm reading for from right now is um, a book that was interpreted by Zachariah Sitchin from Sumerian cuneiform texts that are thousands of years old, 6,000 years old. Um, and all the other things that I talk about on all of my shows, I always verify it with scripture. So you can go back and check all of that out. Now, I'm going to skip on to the next part of because uh, it goes through the different kings and how there was a period of peace on Nibiru. But what eventually happened, like I told you, was there was a, a hole in the ozone that started causing them problems, and they had to figure out what to do. And so I'm going to continue on with the story here. It says, In the atmosphere, breaching has occurred. That was their finding. Volcanoes, the atmosphere's forebears, left belching, were spitting up. Nibiru's air has thinner been made. The protective shield has been diminished. In the reign of Anshar and Kishar, pestilences of field made appearance. 
toil could them not overcome. Um, then sun and shara, then the throne ascended. Of the dynasties six he was. Lordly master of the shara, the name did signify. With great understanding he was born. With much learning he mastered much knowledge. To remedy the affliction ways he sought. Of Nibiru's heavenly circuit he made much study. In its loop of sun's family five members it embraced planets of dazzling beauty. It talks about the the different planets that are on the inner part of Nibiru's orbit. Uh, and then it talks about the hammered bracelet um, and how Nibiru, a long time ago, one of its moons clashed with this planet called Tiamat. And that's what caused the hammered bracelet. But continuing on, in the councils of the learned, cures were av avidly debated. Ways to bandage the wound were urgently considered. A new shield to embrace the planet was attempted. All that was thrust up back to the ground came down. In the councils of the learned, the belching volcanoes were studied. The atmosphere by belching volcanoes having been created, its wound by their diminished belching had come to be. How the feat to achieve, with what tools more belching to attain, none the king could inform. In the reign of Enshar, the breach in the sky grew bigger. Rains were withheld. Winds blew harder. Springs from the depths did not rise. In the lands there was accusation. The breasts of mothers were dry. Um, now we're going to go on to the part about how there was a mutiny uh, and how they rebelled against this one particular king for not doing anything. Um, okay, I'm going to continue on with that. Daru, a child at the palace gateway, found as, as a son she embraced him. Duru, in the end, as a son him adopted, legal heir him decreed. Lama, meaning dryness, was his name. In the end, Lama, the throne, ascended. Though not of on seed, he was the eighth to reign. Once One was to use a metal. Gold was its name. On Nuburu, it was greatly rare. But within the hammered bracelet, it was abundant. It was the only substance that to the finest powder could be ground, lofted high to heaven, suspended it could remain. Thus, with, with replenishment, the breach it would heal. Protection make better. Let celestial boats be built. Let a celestial fleet the gold to Nibiru bring over. Let weapons of terror be created, was the other suggestion. Weapons that the ground shake loose, the mountains split asunder. With missiles, the volcanoes to attack, their dormancy to bestir, their belching to increase, the atmosphere to replenish, the breach to make disappear. For a decision, Lama was too feeble. What choice to make, he knew not. In the land, strife was abundant. Food and water were not abundant. In the land, unity was gone. Accusations were abundant. In the royal court, savants were coming and going. Counselors were rushing and rush, rushing in and rushing out. If destiny it be, let us beseech the great creator of all. To the king, she said, beseeching not acting provide the only hope. What I found really interesting in this book, too, is that these so-called gods also pray to a great creator of all which we know him as Yahweh. But it's interesting that these Sumerian gods uh, with long lives also uh, acknowledge the great creator. Uh, from the olden storehouses, weapons were retrieved. Of rebellion, there was much speaking. A prince in the royal palace was the first to take up arms. By words of promise, the other princes he agitated. Alalu was his name. Um, to the tower of the palace the king escaped. Alalu was him pursuing. In the tower there was a struggle. A lama fell down to his death. Lama is no more, Alalu shouted. The king is no more. With glee he announced. And to the throne room Alalu rushed. On the throne he himself seated. Without right or counsel, a king he, he himself pronounced. Now this is the account of the kingship of Alalu and of the going to earth. In the land, unity was lost. About the kingship, 
Many were aggrieved. In the palace, princes were agitated. In the council, counselors were distraught. From father to son, succession from Anne to the throne continued. Even the Lama, the eighth by adoption, a son was proclaimed. But who was the Lalu? Was he a legal heir? Was he firstborn? Now they made judgment. Now I'm, I'm forwarding a little bit um, past because they they made a judgment. They decided that the Alalu would wrestle a guy named Anu, um, and in in that wrestling, Anu became the king of Nibiru, and Alalu left. He split Nibiru. He took off, and he actually made the first journey to earth. And the reason that he made this journey to earth, um, it says that in this book, never before had the the Anunnaki's uh, crossed the hammered bracelet. It says that many of their ships were destroyed by the hammered bracelet. So they never, ever made it into the inner planet. But Alalu uh, left in a skyship and actually used weapons of terror, it says, to blow a path through the hammered bracelet. And then once he arrived here to the earth, uh, that's when he radioed back to Nibiru that he had found gold in abundance here upon the planet earth. And he then told them that because he had made it to the earth and he had located the gold, that he wanted to have his kingship restored and he wanted to be a king back on Nibiru. So I'm going to read a little bit of that. Okay. For nine counted periods, Alalu was king on Nibiru. In the ninth shar, Anu gave battle to Alalu. To hand-to-hand -hand combat with bodies naked, Alalu he challenged. Let the winner be king, Anu said. They grappled with each other in the public square. Doorposts trembled and walls shook. Alalu bent his knee. To the ground he fell on his chest. Alalu in combat was defeated. By acclaim, Anu was held as king. Anu to the palace was escorted. Alalu to the palace did not return. Unbeknownst to others, to the place of the celestial chariot, he hurriedly went. Into a missile-throwing chariot, Alalu climbed. Its hatch behind him he closed. The four-part chamber he entered, the commander's seat he occupied. That which shows the way he lit up, with bluish aura the chamber filling. The fire stones he stirred up. Their hum like music was enthralling. The chariot's great cracker he enlivened. A reddish brilliance it was casting. Unbeknownst to others, in the celestial boat, Alalu from Nibiru escaped. To snow-hued earth, Alalu set his course by a secret from the beginning. He chose his destination. Georgia, do you want to comment on this? Uh, and I, I know you're monitoring the chat room. I'm, I'm not myself, but uh, did you want to comment on this before I move on? And that way I can sip some water, too. I tell you what, you have your sip of water because I have a couple things to say. <laughs> you know, okay. I'm trying to uh, explain to everyone on the, uh, the chat room that a lot of people say that we're just giving more time to Satan and uh, evil teachings and so forth. But if you think that, you're really missing the point of this show. Uh, as we know, none of us were here a thousand years ago. None of us were here uh, when uh, before uh, the first, I should say, when Jesus Christ walked the earth. We have to go on the Bible to learn about these things. Well, just as well as we need to go to the Bible, there were other books that man chose not to put in the Bible, because in my opinion, Enoch should have been placed within the Bible. But, you know, when we go, and, and the reason why I say that, let me clarify this, what, the reason why I say this is because Enoch actually reverts back to the Bible and gives credence to what is in the Bible, but just goes in a deeper explanation. And as well as the book of Enoch is also mentioned in the Bible. A lot of people want to tend away from the 
uh, extra biblical text, and I, I, I do understand that. But you know, if you have um, if you have discernment, you will know what is truth and what is false. I'm not saying that all extra biblical books are correct, but I, I do say that the ones that we're speaking of, we're giving uh, information that we're in it, like Book of Jubilees, Book of Enoch, and so forth, to give credence to the Bible and to give ex- uh, better explanation to what exactly happened with these fallen angels who later on, uh, their descendants and so forth, have been playing the role of uh, little G gods. And what is going on in today's world still with these, uh, now, they're, now they pose themselves as aliens and so forth in our culture, but they're, they're spreading the same exact word as those um, fallen angels and those um, the in the Sumerian text, how they tried to pass themselves off as gods. Now, the um, what's really funny about it is if you look in ancient uh, uh, statues, tablets, books, whatever, you find that this happened. This is happening, and this has happened all throughout culture. Because in Japan, they uh, worship a dragon god that came from a sky. Uh, the Australian Abor- Aborigines they do uh, their worship to a reptilian god which lives underground, they call it. Then we have, um, and they're supposed to be governed over the human race. There's people in India that uh, they worship the Nagas, which we know is a serpent race, the serpents or whatever. And um, same thing with the uh, Africans. They do the Chukachari, I think you pronounce it, but it's uh, children of the serpent. All these things, uh, the Mayans also, they had theirs. The Hopi Indians, they, they worship the Snake Brothers, the Sioux. That word means snake. The Iroquois means serpent. All these things are all coming down from this false, these false gods that we're talking about. And the only reason we bring it up is because a lot of people are being misled into really believing that these so say little G gods have created us. And we're just trying to bring about this is false knowledge, uh, giving you the word of God, giving you also the word of extra biblical books just so that you can have that understanding. So I, I just wanted to clarify that because, to me, the chat room has been really hopping over there, <laughs> and, you know, people need to understand that there's a difference. We're not talking sci-fi. We're talking about actual events that are even occurring today with this new teaching of Nibiru and so forth. So back to you. Uh, well, you know, for me, it all goes back to Genesis 6, 1 through 4, where the Bible is talking about the sons of God uh, coming down and mating with the daughters of man creating a race of giants, if you don't know about what I'm talking about right now, right now, and then if you don't know about the book of Enoch, how are you going to explain any of this? And if for those that, you know, even if you just observe what's here upon this planet with all of these megalithic structures um, and all, you know, there's so many astronauts now and uh, people that have come out of NASA that have talked about different structures on both the moon and Mars and structures right here on our own planet that we cannot uh, create even with our modern technology right now. Uh, And so what I'm trying to teach people about is the time before modern humanity came here on this planet when the fallen angels were here and they were the ones that created much of this megalithic uh, structures and stuff that we cannot even explain today. And so for those that have discernment on this and already understand what I'm talking about, uh, you, I'm trying to warn you that the Vatican and the great falling away is going to have a lot to do with these so-called ancient astronauts, these Anunnaki, those from the heaven to the earth who came, uh, they are going to try to push themselves off as the creators of humanity. And for a lot of people uh, in this world, uh, that may sound fantastical, but as we move further and further into, uh, into history and into the next couple of years, this theme, this topic will come out more and more and more. The Da Vinci Code, the, them saying that Christ seeded his own seed line here and that he had his own children, that is going to be all part of this great deception that we're talking about. And for those of you that all of this is new uh, and you've never heard about this before, yeah, it sounds strange, but go and do your own research 
and then you'll get a better understanding on this. Um, okay, but anyways, I'm going to continue on with the story of Alalu and how when he first reached the earth. In the distance, the sun's fiery ball, its brilliance, was sending forth welcoming rays towards Alalu it was emitting. Before it, a red-brown planet. On its circuit was coursing the sixth in the count of celestial gods it was. Alalu could but glimpse it. On its destined course from Alalu's path, it was quickly moving. Then snow-hued earth appeared, the seventh in the celestial count. Toward the planet, Alalu set his course to destination. Smaller than Nibiru was its alluring ball, weaker than Nibiru its attracting net. Its atmosphere, thinner than Nibiru's was, clouds were within it, swirling. Below, the earth to three regions was divided. Snow white at the top and on the bottom, blue and brown in, in between. Deathly, Alalu spread the chariot, the testing wings around the earth's ball to circle. In the middle regions, dry lands and watery oceans he could discern. The beam that penetrates downward he directed. Earth inward to detect. I have attained it. Ecstatically, he shouted. Gold, much gold the beam has indicated. It was beneath the dark-hued region. In the waters it was, too. Fully caught in earth's attracting net, the chariot was moving faster. Its spread wings became a glow. Earth's atmosphere like an oven was. And then the chariot shook emitting a mortifying thunder. With abruptness, the chariot crashed, with the suddenness altogether stopping. Senseless from the shaking, stunned by the crash, Alalu was without moving. And this is, talks about how he had arrived here to the earth. And then he uh, called back to the planet, uh, to Nibiru, to tell the other fallen angels that were there about um, about what he had discovered. And they were seeking this gold, I told you, to heal this hole in their atmosphere. And so that's when they started, uh, they sent a whole nother crew. Once Alalu had landed here on the planet, they sent a, a crew of 50 Anunnaki here to this earth and that's when they establish Iridu, uh, home in the faraway. And they established Iridu specifically to, uh, to get the gold that was here on this planet. And they established way stations, uh, according to them, they established way stations both on Mars and the moon. And the reason being is because the atmosphere, the, the pool was a lot less. Uh, and it was um, a wayward point. It was a, a jump off to um, the route the, that they needed to follow to get to um, to Nibiru. Uh, Georgia, do you want to comment? Um, well, right now I'm still watching the uh, talk line, the chat line, uh, but I wasn't really paying attention to your question. I'm sorry. I was just trying to keep in line with what they were talking about. But, you know, um, I'm actually glad we're doing this show because I, I just – I just know that the information that you're bringing forth is in a lot of um, a lot of the. Um, can you hear me, Zen? Yes. Okay. A lot of the um, information that you're bringing forth, you know, it, it's a great tool for those who are searching for truth, those who are searching, you know, and trying to understand what what is happening right now with our religious systems and they're trying to bring on this one world system all of what you're talking about all relates to this it, it will help people understand how there's so much false religion being bought on the people today and it basically all stems from what you're talking about it, it, the the masters behind this are from darkness we're not uh, given any credence to or saying that we believe in the dark side we're just trying to point to you that this stuff is a this the, the information you're giving is very spiritual and it all comes down to what's being done right at this time right now and as is, as in 
uh, as is prophesied in the Bible, what is going to happen. Because we will, according to the Bible, they're going to try to put a one-world religion on us. And if you can see how and what took place back when in history, biblical history, you can understand why and, um, you know, how they're going to go about trying to make this deception work. And a lot of people, unfortunately, are going to fall for it because it says, uh, broad is that uh, path leading to destruction, and narrow is the way leading to our Father. So, you know, I just want to point that out uh, as well. Absolutely. Um, this story that I'm, I know we've only got 19 minutes, and I know I'm not going to be able to cover a lot of this, so I'll probably have to do another show on this at another time. But in this next part, um, and again, I'm skipping ahead in the story, uh, to where the other 50 Anunnaki have already arrived on the earth, um, and there's a competition for kingship of the earth. And Alalu, um, again, wrestles Anu for kingship on Nibiru. He loses again, but the, the strange thing in this story, it says that uh, when he loses, he actually bites the testicles off of Anu. And because of this, he is um, banished to exile. Well, first they wanted to put him to death. But uh, I'm going to explain this story because this talks about how the face on Mars came into being, which I found, which was really interesting too. Because supposedly the face on Mars is a depiction of this guy, Alalu, who was exiled to die there all alone. And so I'm going to read this story. Um, to die in exile, let this be the judgment, Anu was saying. In amazement, the judges at each other glanced. What Anu was saying, they wondered. Neither on earth nor on Nibiru shall the exiling be, Anu was saying. On the way, there is the Lamu planet. Lamu is Mars, the planet Mars uh, in, Sumer, in Sumer. On the way, there is the Lamu planet with waters and an atmosphere it is endowed. See, they, they're talking about how Mars has water and an atmosphere. Enki, as Ea thereon made a pause, of it as a way station have I been thinking. Its net force is less than that of Earth, forceful, and advantage in wisdom to be considered. In the celestial chariot, a lalu shall be taken. On my departing from Earth, he with me shall make the journey. Around the planet Lamu, we shall make circuit. To Alalu, a sky chamber we shall provide. To the planet Lamu, in it he will be descended. Alone on a strange planet, in exile he shall be. His days to his last day by himself to count. Thus did Anu words of judgment utter. In solemnity were the words intended. A place for landing on firm soil you must prepare, Anu to Enlil was saying, how Lamu as a way station to utilize plans you should be making. So they're talking about right here how they want to set up Mars as a way station for bringing this gold to Nibiru. Um, farewells there were, both joy and sorrow. Uh, toward Red Hood Lamu they journeyed. Twice about it they circled. Lower toward the strange planet they came, mountains sky high, and tears on the surface they noticed. Where Ea's chariot had once landed, they observed. By a lakeside it was located. Slowly, by Lamu net power in the chariot, the sky chamber they readied. Anzu, its pilot, then unexpected words to Anu was saying, With a Lalu, to the firm soil of Lamu I shall descend. With the sky chamber to the chariot to return I wish not. With Alalu on the strange planet I shall stay until he dies. I shall protect him. And when he dies of his inward per inner poison, as befit the king, him I shall bury. As for me, I shall have made my name. Anzu, they will say against all odds to a king in exile, a companion he was. He saw things by others unseen. On a strange planet, he faced unknown things. Anzu, 
They will to the end of life of time shall say, like a hero has fallen. Uh, there were tears in the eyes of Lalu. There was amazement in the heart of Anu. Your wish shall be honored to Anzu, Anu said. Hereby let a promise by me to you be made. By my raised hand to you I swear this. On the next journey, a chariot by Lamu shall circuit. Its skyship to you shall descend. If alive it shall find you, the master of Lamu you shall be proclaimed. When a way station on Lamu shall be established, its commander you shall be. Anzu bowed his head, so be it to Anu, he said. Now, this next particular part, I know we've got 14 minutes left, but I think it's very important that I at least cover this part. Um, Georgia, did you want to make a comment on that before I move on? No, I want you to go ahead with the reading. It's interesting. Okay. Uh, this is talking about how these so-called Anunnaki, these fallen angels, created way stations on both Mars and the moon. Well, they didn't do it on the moon at first because they found it unnecessary, but later they did establish a way station on the moon. Um, okay, so I'm continuing on. Way stations from Nibiru to Earth to establish all the sins family in one kingdom to encompass. The first on Lamu to be fashioned. The moon for the plans also to be considered. On the other planets or their circling hosts, stations to set up. A chain, a constant caravan of chariots to supply and safeguard the gold from earth without interruptions to Nibiru bring. Perchance, Gold elsewhere also to find. The salvation of Nibiru in the plans they all a promise saw. Savants and commanders, knowledge of the celestial gods perfected. To chariots and skyships, a new kind, rocket ships were added. Heroes for the task were selected. For the task there was much learning. The plans to Enki and Enlil were beamed over. Preparations on earth to hurry, they were told. On earth of what had happened and what to be done is required, there was much discussion. An earth splitter with cleverness Inky designed. On Nibiru that it be fashioned, he requested. Therewith in the earth to make a gash, its innards reached by way of tunnel. That which crunches and that which crushes, he also designed. On Nibiru for the Abzu to be fashioned. Uh, before I go on with the rest of this part about the way station, I wanted to say that we know all over the earth there are ancient tunnel structures uh, that have been found that, and everybody knows about the deep underground bases and all the different connecting links between the, all those deep underground bases. Um, many of these ancient structures were created by the Anunnaki. It, it talks about it right here. And all these ancient tunnel systems that we find all over the world, we didn't create it. It was here. And they were the ones that created it, as it says in this particular book. Uh, again, I don't give credence 100% to what I'm reading, to the Sumerian teachings, because they were the conquerors. Inki, one of these fallen angels, he wrote this book himself. The cuneiform text that Zachariah Sitchin reinterpreted, uh, the ones that I'm reading from, Enki himself wrote these down. So how do we know if they're true, if he's one of the fallen angels and he's been lying to us since time immemorial anyway? But I do find it interesting just reading the story. So let me take a sip of water and I'll continue on. Okay, continuing on with the way station. Of matters Nibiru Savanti to contemplate asked. Of matters of health and well-being of heroes, the, need, the needs he listed. To the heroes, Earth's quick circuits were upsetting. Earth's quick day and night cycle dizziness were causing. The atmosphere, though good, was in some things lacking, in others too abundant. Of the sameness of the food, the heroes were complaining. 
Enlil, the commander, by the heat of the sun on earth was afflicted. For coolness and shade he was longing, while in the Abzu Inki preparations was making. Enlil, in his sky ship, the extent of the Eden was surveying. Of mountains and rivers he took account, of valleys and plains the measures he took, where a landing place to establish, a place for the rocket ship he was seeking. Enlil, by the heat of the sun afflicted, for a place of coolness and shade was searching. To snow-covered mountains on Eden's north side he took a liking. The tallest trees he ever saw grew there in a cedar forest. There, above a mountain valley with power, beams the surface he flattened. Great stones from the... I want to read that one more time. There, above a mountain valley with power beams the surface he flattened. Remember that um, the, the largest cedar, they grow over there near Bashan uh, in uh, a place called Syria, modern-day Syria, and that Bashan has been linked to giants of old. And we also know that Baalbek is also there, and that Baalbek has these uh, trilithium stones that are so massive, uh, nobody... Can, none of our modern technology can even lift those stones now. And I find it interesting in this particular passage how he talks about how he was trying to create a landing place for the rocket ship and that in this place near these tallest of trees, a cedar forest, he used this power beam to, to, to flatten the surface of the land. Great stones from the hillside the heroes quarried and to size cut, to uphold the platform with sky ships they carried and in place them. With satisfaction did in will the handiwork consider. A work beyond belief indeed it was, a structure of everlasting. And we know right now that those particular landing platforms, that one large stone is still in existence over there. Uh, you can look up those truly trial. I think they're called trillium stones, whatever they're called, but they are massive. And, um, you know, this particular story uh, indicates uh, those, particular, those particular stones. The bode of the North Crest, he named it. On Nibiru, a new celestial chariot for soaring off was prepared. New kinds of rocket ships, sky ships, and that which Inky had designed, it was transporting. A fresh group of 50 from Nibiru it was taking. Chosen females from among, among, um, among them were. The course of prior chariots on tablets of destinies recorded. Nungul, its pilot, did follow. Beside a lakeshore, uh, this is when the 50 are returning back to the earth. And as they, uh, as they, as they made a promise to Anzu when he stayed there with Alalu, they go back to Mars and they stop there. Now this is um, this is the accounting of how the face on Mars came into being. Besides a, a faint beaming, a group of heroes followed. Ninma was going with them. Beside a lake shore, Anzu they found from his helmet the signals were beaming. Um, gently upon his face, Ninma water of life poured his lips with the wedding. Gently into his mouth the food of life she played. He led them to a great rock, like a mountain from the plain heavenward rising. This is on Mars now. In the great rock a cave I found, a lalu's corpse therein I hid. Its entrance with stones I covered. So was Anzu to them saying. They followed him to the rock, the stones they removed, the cave they entered. Inside what of Alalu they found. He who once was on Nibiru a king was a pile of bones, was in a cave now lying. And for the first time in our annals, a king not on Nibiru has died. Not on Nibiru was he buried. So did Ninma say, let him in peace for eternity rest, she was saying. They, the cave entrance, again with stones covered. Um, the image 
of Alalu upon the great rock mountain with beams they carved. They showed him wearing an eagle's helmet. His face they made uncovered. Let the image of Lalu forever gaze toward Nibiru that he ruled, toward the earth whose gold he discovered. So Ninma, exalted lady in the name of her father Anu, did declare, As for you, Anzu, to you Anu the king his promise shall be keeping. Twenty heroes with you here shall remain, the way stations building to begin. Rocket ships from earth the golden ore shall here deliver. Celestial chariots from here the gold to Nibiru shall then transport. Hundreds of heroes their abode on Lamu shall make. You, Anzu, shall be their commander. Thus did the great lady in the name of her father Anu to Anzu said, My life I owe to you, great lady, so was Anzu saying. My gratitude to Anu shall have limits not have. From the planet Lamu, the chariot departed. Toward Earth, the journey continued. And I know we only have three minutes remaining, so I think this is probably a good place for me to stop. But just know in that last chapter that I read, talking about the death of this Nuberian king who was exiled to Mars, that the space on Mars, where it shows him wearing a helmet, with his face exposed, is an image that the Anunnaki created as a representation of this king, who was the first Nibirian king to not die on his own planet. Uh, Georgia, would you like to comment on those things that I just said? Well, yeah and no. <laughs> I have just a couple of statements to make about what we're talking about. Basically, this planet X, which you're going to probably get into in another show, I think, because uh, we're running out of time. But I just want to make it uh, known to everyone that the planet X that they're talking about in the 2012 and all this, you know, a lot of people don't realize that this is actually a bit in our, not really our culture, but the uh, the non-biblical history as far as the Sumerians, because they called the planet X Nibiru. The Babylonians called it uh, Marduk, and the Mesopotamians, Mesopotamians, they call it the 12th planet. All these things are all not just something somebody created over the last four or five years. This is something that is coming forward. And, and in the time that we're in now, they're talking about the 2012, this um, this new age and all this, what's happening. You know, there's a part in the Bible, and I think it's in Matthew. I, no, I'm not a preacher, so I can't give you specific books. But they talk about this alignment where the sun is not going to be able to show any light, and we know that this planet X is going to go into that alignment as well. So I just think that there's a connection there. We probably need to, like you said, have another show to really get into it because I know we don't have time. But just to let everybody know, what we're talking about and what we're trying to bring forward is not if, – if it does occur, God, yes, of course, he has allowed it to happen, but we're just telling you what the, the Sumerians' tablets are trying to bring forward today. So I just want to point that out, Zen. Um, with the last minute remaining, I'm going to tell people that this planet that I'm talking about, Nibiru, you can find it in Revelation as the planet that is described as Wormwood. Now, remember, when this planet enters into our atmosphere again, and the Vatican knows that it's coming, it's on its way back toward the Earth right now. That when this planet enters into our atmosphere, we're going to have asteroid impact damage here upon our Earth, it, in the Bible, it talks about how one-third of the uh, creatures in the sea will die, one-third of the ships destroyed, one-third of the waters of this planet become bitter and no longer drinkable. This that I'm talking about, the return of Nibiru, is essential for understanding Revelation because what happens with Wormwood is describing what happens with this particular planet that is back on its way. It's described in the Colburn Bible as the destroyer. Um, and as Georgia said, you know, many others mention it by name, Marduk or whatever they choose to call it. But uh, a, a lot of the ancient cultures and the ancient religions know that this planet has a big part to play in the end of days and uh, the unfolding of Revelation. And so that's why we're trying to bring all this information to you. And so, Georgia, I just want to thank you again for joining us for another show and for 
always um, spurring uh, conversation and dialogue and for monitoring the chat room for me because I can't watch it. It's too distracting. Oh, I know that, uh, you know, a lot of people are calling me a lot of things in there, but whatever. Um, God bless, and thank you for joining us for another show. We'll talk to everybody soon, and um, take care, and may the Lord bless you with discernment and wisdom, and God bless. In Yahushua Yahweh's name I pray. Stay blessed, everyone. You too, Georgia. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.